In page 395 of his study guide, Let's Get Biblical, Tobias Singer answers a question about the rabbinic doctrine of Satan. The questioner asks how God, who is good and holy, can possibly be the author of evil, not just in the sense of allowing for evil to exist, but in the sense that God actively creates evil. Singer responds that God placed both good and evil into the world. He cites two verses to support this. The first is Deuteronomy 30.15, which states, See, I, God, have set before thee this day life and good, death and evil. The second is Isaiah 45, 7, which states, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Singer then goes on to attack the Christian doctrine. These two verses, Isaiah 45, 7 and Deuteronomy 30, 15, however, pose a serious theological problem to Christians who maintain that God did not create Satan, the angel of evil. According to Christian doctrine, as you suggest in your question, Satan was the highest ranking angel who, through his own act of spiritual defiance and outright disobedience, became the chief adversary and slanderer of God and the embodiment of evil in the world. In Christian theology, God never created evil. He is only the author of righteousness and perfection as you maintain in your question. Therefore, God could never create something as sinister as the devil himself. Rather, Satan's unyielding wickedness is the result of his own spiritual rebellion. Well, Singer then compares the Christian view of good and evil to the dualism of Zoroastrianism, where the god Ahura Mazda has two equal manifestations, Spenta, good, and Angra, evil. Singer then states that angel means messenger, and that no angel in the Tanakh ever opposes God's will, Satan included. Singer then mentions the book of Job, where Satan appears before God to test the faithfulness of Job. God allows Satan to do so as long as the latter is not allowed to kill Job. According to Singer, Satan obediently follows his creator's instructions, a statement which implies that God actually ordered Satan to torment Job, rather than just giving Satan permission. Singer then states, Still, by the end of this unparalleled biblical narrative, Job's virtue prevails over Satan's unyielding torment. When in Christian terms, Job's personal spiritual triumph is a theological impossibility, in Jewish terms it stands out as the embodiment of God's salvation program for mankind. Singer then goes on to attack the NIV translation as a skewed understanding that conceals Isaiah's original message in order to preserve a Christian doctrine that contradicts what the Jewish scriptures so clearly teach. I have to give Rabbi Singer points for rhetoric. When read by an average individual, his argument implies that the NIV translators deliberately mistranslated Isaiah. That Deuteronomy 30.15 states that God actively creates evil, and therefore we have two passages now to support the claim instead of merely one verse. That the King James translates Isaiah 45.7 as moral evil, and that God actively ordered Satan to torment Job. When pressed by an apologist on these claims, Singer can rightly claim that he never explicitly stated any of them. Pretty clever, huh? First off, a little background about the book of Job. Christian theology does not state that God and Satan are in any way equals or counterparts. All angels, including Satan, are inferior created beings who are helpless to resist God's omnipotence as we are. This is why Satan has to ask permission in order to torment God's servant Job. The narrative then continues where Satan destroys Job's estate, kills his entire family, and if that wasn't enough, inflicts plagues and illnesses upon the poor man. Job's friends try to comfort him by offering Job a theodicy, an explanation as to why a good God is allowing Job to suffer. After Job continues to complain, God finally appears, rebukes Job and his friends, and then tells Job that God does not owe anyone an explanation to why they suffer. We do not have God's vast perspective and extraordinary knowledge. We were not there at the creation of the world. We are weak, short-lived creatures who may not even be able to comprehend God's reasons for his actions. The focus of Job is on the problem of evil. The fact that we have no explanation for why a good God allows evil to exist and may never have such an explanation does not in any way indicate that there is no explanation. God does restore Job's fortune at the end of the book, but there is no indication that this is a reward for Job's faithfulness. In fact, it probably isn't, considering what Job says at the beginning of the chapter. I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, 
things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Hear and I will speak, I will question you, and you will make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you, and therefore I despise myself, and repent in dust and ashes. In Deuteronomy, the text seems to indicate that Israel is given two options. Be faithful, loyal, and good, and you will have life and prosperity. Be apostate, disloyal, and evil, and you will have death and ruin. Where is the indication that God actively created evil? How about we ask the rabbinic tradition? Rav Yochanan said of this verse, From the day that God made this declaration, goodness and evil did not emanate from his mouth. Rather, evil comes of its own accord to the one who does evil, and good comes to one who does good. What about Isaiah 45, 7, where God states that he creates evil? The word evil has more than one meaning, and those alternate, non-moral meanings were in greater usage during the time that the King James Bible was written. I was curious which definition of evil Tobia meant in this context. Here are five definitions of evil I found in the dictionary. Evil, noun. 1. That which is evil. Evil quality, intention, or conduct, to choose the lesser of two evils. 2. The force in nature that governs and gives rise to wickedness and sin. 3. The wicked or immoral part of something or someone or something, like the evil in his nature has destroyed the good. 4. Harm, mischief, misfortune, to wish one evil. 5. Anything causing injury or harm. Tobacco is considered by some to be an evil. Is this passage talking about evil in a moral sense? Let's look at the Hebrew to see if it helps us. Yotzer or uvrei hoshech, ose shalom uvrei ra, ani adonai ose kal ele. Forming light and creating darkness, establishing peace and creating ra. I, the Lord, create all these. Obviously, the word in question is Ra, Strong's H7451, which can mean bad, evil, distress, misery, injury, or calamity. Basically, it's the same as our English word bad, and carries a lot of the same meanings. But which meaning? Let's look at the context. The verse features two parallel lines, each line comparing two opposite ideals. God creates light, and its opposite, darkness. God establishes peace, and its opposite, Ra, or chaos. Is there any support of this interpretation from rabbinic commentaries? I found one from Redak in the Jewish press Tanakh, who stated that in this context, Ra means the opposite of peace, war with Babylon. Redak seems to indicate that this isn't a statement that God creates moral evil, but a statement that God creates peace and breaks peace, or that he both calms and agitates. Oh, I almost forgot. Singer complains that some Christians believe Isaiah 14.12 is about Satan. I will admit that the oracle delivered by Isaiah is addressed to Nebuchadnezzar, but there is at least one part of the oracle that seems different. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn! How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low! You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. But you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. I am not sure if you can apply this to Nebuchadnezzar. What pagan king, after all, tried to supplant God's rule over heaven? only to fall from it. None that I know of. Shalom. Aleichem.